Now, you know what? I, I want to ask or, or expand on one more thing, and I'm going to turn the mic over, pass Go the ahead. mic to Brother Richard. You know, if you look at our struggle since we've been here, in the early 1900s, I guess from a period to maybe 1900 to 1925, mm-hmm. the talented 10th philosophy among blacks seemed to be working. And I think it worked uh, in conjunction with the system that we were under. And when I say that, I'm saying this. We were living in a racist society which marginalized our people and forced our people to live among one another. So when you had black doctors, black lawyers, uh, black professionals, black artisans, they lived among the community and by and law or or as a byproduct of that, the community started to rise. And you had mm-hmm. the Black Wall Streets, you had the Rosewoods, you had uh, mm-hmm. the Wilmington, North Carolinas, you had them all over the country. All, all now, over the country. Now, if you look at the other side of the coin, you had a white society that was either rich or poor. And most whites were poor and lived yeah, in the cities. Were. So, being that they didn't have the job opportunities, they started doing what you see that they point the finger at our people now. They started uh, bootlegging, selling dope, Uh killing one another, Uh Chicago, New York, gangsters, Uh firing guns all in the street, murder capitals of the world. After the, the, the market fell in the 30s and they come up with this new deal and, and uh, uh, all these uh, 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 WPA to put white folks in a position to develop what is considered now as the middle class. At the times we were talking about, there were no middle class. Uh-huh. So we see that the talented 10th worked when our people had a mindset to work with one another. I think they ramped up the strategy that you're talking about after or, or during the time of Roosevelt and moving forward and the development of yeah. that white middle class, they ramped up this strategy of self-hate to counter that talented 10th. What's your feelings yeah. on that? Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. And I, I, I spoke uh, all of that's in the book. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> all, all, all of that right there is in the book. Um, because we were forced to live together, We um, the talented 10th lived with the 90%. And we had black Wall Streets all over the country. So we had a lot of people talk about South Oklahoma, but you named a few others. I mean, there were there were these thriving towns all over the country. Our our towns were better than better than all the Caucasian towns. Yes. And so when, when we see in Red Summer in 1921, when they began to burn our towns down, you know, so there's a collusion between the government and the poor Caucasians to destroy our 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 towns. But now, see, this is the thing by our we got to get on top of our education, which is one of the parts of the system of self-hate. Uh, so we're, people are just finding out about the Black Wall Street, and most people still don't know that, all right, after those towns were burned down, we, we, we rebuilt more towns. Because, again, the talented 10th being with the 90%, it, it, it's, enough, it's no way to prevent the people from building up because the talented 10th is going to do everything to help everybody else when they're forced to. Okay. So we built those towns back up from the 1920s up into the 1950s until we had integration. <laughs> and I always let people understand integration had nothing to do with Caucasians' moral epiphany. They didn't just all of a sudden become good people and say, well, I think it's time that we should want to live with them. Integration was all about them being able to infiltrate our communities that we had that were thriving. So we had uh, integration started in, well, in 1954, and then in 1956, the Highway Act was passed. So now they're building these new highways, and literally, I mean, this, this, this always sounds like a, a boogeyman ghost story, but it's true. In 1956, when they passed this Highway Act, they literally, literally built highways through every single black business district. They eminent domain every black business district all the way up until 1997. They eminent domain the business district in Miami. The last one that they took. They literally eminent domain our our business districts. 
and then they build highways through. It correlates with uh, integration, and then they begin to lure the best of us away. Well, you can come live with us now since we're integrated, or you can come work with us now and you, after they've destroyed their businesses. So now they got to choose now. i got to relocate my business because they destroyed the black district. So where am I going to relocate to now? I can't put it anywhere. So now they're, they're, they're luring us to come in certain areas, and that's, where they, that's when they physically separated the talented 10th from the 90% after integration and this highway act. That's when they physically separated us, but then they began to mentally um, separate us after that. You know, it's kind of ironic that you mentioned that because I was listening to a terrestrial radio program on Friday, and, uh, and it was out of Richmond, Virginia, and the, the older gentleman was saying that uh, it, during that period that you're talking about that they built I-95 straight through a black commercial district in Richmond and basically yeah. tore it apart. So I, it's kind of ironic that you said that because I heard that being stated by an older gentleman uh, two days ago. It's real. In Kellogg, Missouri, in 1981, they they just they took the area in Kellogg, Missouri, and built the Lambert Airport, the freeways, all the freeways that you see in LA. So all they got like five, seven different freeways. All of those freeways represent a black business district that's gone. <laughs> Brother Richard. Yes, sir. I, and, and brother, well, you know what? I want to start off with um, brother Chance. Can you uh, lay out the um, what's that? The chapters to your book? Yeah. So uh, as soon as we start, you, you want me to just name them or name? Or yes. Yeah. Details? Just okay. Well, just the first the first thing we're doing is um, is is identifying the system. Uh, after we go into identifying the system, we deal with the five parts five working parts of the, of the system of self-hate, economics, education, entertainment, etiquette, and then news. Um, and then after we go through those, we deal with the psychological buy-in of how they get people to buy into uh, being against their own best self-interest. So with our entertainers, they use brand protection. They tell you you're protecting your brand. Um, with our corporate people, they use professionalism. So professionalism is never going to include anything black. And then with the everyday person, they, they use reverse racism. So if we talk about building our own black town, they convince some of our people that doing that is racist or being black black first or supporting black businesses is racist. So uh, those are the chapters and um, the different little breakdown. And, and, and the, the other thing that, that comes to me, I'd like you to develop um, um, in order to, to set the context of, uh, as I see also the conversation is, uh, and I heard you do it, but the question about system, how do you define a system and how do you define um, uh, um, this system actually doing this? I, uh, you gave a lot, a lot of examples that's in your book about um, the outcomes that are given, but as it being a system, how did you how did you come to recognize it as a system and what makes it a system? Okay. Well, a system is a well organized and purposeful structure with members, entities, factors, and parts that simultaneously influence each other in order to maintain their existence, the existence of the system in order to maintain the goal of the system. So that's just what a system is, uh, definition wise, uh per collegiate um uh, Western Dictionary. Now, uh, how did I come to see it as a system? I was just just looking at it, you know, when I just just begin to look at history and seeing things done over and over and over again, um, seeing things being intentional. So when we start with the when we start with the economics, so that's where that's where we start at. So like I said, we had our own town. They burned our towns down. They, they thought that was going to work. So now after they burned the towns down, we rebuilt the towns again. So it's like, damn. Well, if we burn their towns down, all they're going to do is rebuild these towns. And uh, as I said, they believe in the talented tip theory. So now either we burn these towns down and they continue to build them up and eventually build a military and overtake us, or we find a way to take this talented tip apart. So this way we don't have to burn them down, but we can get them out of the neighborhood so they won't build them up. So economically, they 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 destroyed our um our business district, they use integration to lure our people, our, our talented tenants into their neighborhoods. And once they did that, 
we move into the educational system. So now, after Brown versus the Board of Education, which, oh, my God, is this, as, as Malcolm said, only a fool will send their children to be educated by their enemy. And so with this education system, they wipe out black accomplishments. I mean, it's a, it's a travesty that I just found out about Reverend Leon, and I'm from Philly, to find out about Reverend Leon Sullivan just a few years ago and everything that he did. I, I'm so ashamed, and, I, and, I, and I, I, I'm okay with, you know, uh, being transparent about my, you know, my ignorance. One day, I, I, I caught the train to go to Cecil B. Moore Avenue to go down to the UNIA, and it's a couple of years ago, and when I got off the train, because I had never got, got on the train down there before, I saw this big picture of this black man, and, and next to the black man was the name Cecil B. Moore, and I had no idea Cecil B. Moore was black, who he was, or what he did. Now, I knew the street my entire life. I'm, talking about, I'm about 33 years old when this happened. I, I'm, and so I'm trying to figure out, well, how come I never learned this? Why are the, is the Philadelphia school system not teaching these great accomplishments of these men who have streets named after them? So I'm, I'm looking at this education system, and the system is being used to do three things. It's used, one, because majority of the teachers are middle-aged white women. So it's, it's used to uh, give the impression that white people hold the keys to all the proper information. So we have people uh, who, if a Dr. Francis Crest Welsing or a Neely Fuller or Amos Wilson, John Henry Clark, when, if, 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 if we hear any information from them that contradicts what we heard from Caucasians, we'll side with the Caucasians before we side with our own black psychologists because the education system trained us to do that. It also, uh, when you read the quote that's in the education that they, um, um, section, it comes from Carter G. Woodson, when he says that the same educational system that inspires the oppressor by making him believe he created everything worthwhile sparks and crushes the genius of the black child by making him feel his people have never done anything that have amounted to anything, and they will never be on the level of other races. A Negro thus educated is a hopeless liability to his race. So Carter G. Woodson in his book, The Miseducation of the Negro, lays out how the educational system is used to make us still inferior. Because now they're going to, they're teach, they'll teach us about uh, explorers. First of all, they, they, they always, um, you know, phrase things to make it sound better. Uh, and I, <laughs> my daughter almost got in trouble a little bit in school because, I don't allow her to call, you know, pilgrims, explorers, or anything. She has to call them terrorists because that's what they are. Um, so whenever they talk about their school, she says, no, can you please call them terrorists because those people are terrorists. They came to a country and killed people. They're terrorists. So, so they, they teach these explorers. They'll teach Leopold, but they won't teach that Leopold killed millions and millions of, of, of Africans. They'll teach Cecil Rhodes, and even black people want to get a Rhodes scholarship, but they won't teach that he went in South Africa and killed millions and millions of Africans. Now, they'll teach us that Hitler killed Jews, and they want us to hate Hitler, but they won't teach us about any of these other Caucasians who harm black people. So this education system will esteem and venerate the Caucasian all over the world, but they will never teach any of the accomplishments of African people all across the world. Well, we've done everything. I mean, it, it it almost sounds like you just want to be a black supremacist by saying we created everything, but it's just the truth. It's just a factual thing, but they don't teach you. And so the school system does that. Then the third thing the school system does is, it, well, in the black neighborhoods, is it, it, it undereducates us. So, so the most that we can do is work for them. You know, so when I'm just looking at what it does over and over and over again, because it's one thing if something happens one time, but when something repetitively happens, that's a system. That is something that somebody is intentionally doing. So if something has happened over and over again in different ways. It's like the movie 13th, how he showed us that, you know, there was no prison system prior to the ending of slavery. And once slavery was over, all of a sudden they built jails and we dominated the jails immediately. They locked us up for all kinds of different things. And so as I looked at what was happening, the frequency of how it was happening, I was able to see that this is not just happenstance. This is, this is intentional, and this here is a system. So in 1903, um, W.E.B. Du Bois published an, an article um, titled The Talented Tenth, and in it he describes how, and it wasn't just about um, Africans who were here in America, it's about just um, races in general. 
and his philosophy was that um, with any any race, it's going to be about 10% of that race who are going to be uh, – uh, I, I hate it, Kim, because sometimes you want to feel like it makes it sense these people are better because it's not that you're better. Everybody just has different roles. But it's going to be uh, 10% of the people who are a little more genius, um, who are going to be a little bit more wealthy, who are going to be a little bit more prominent, who are going to be a little bit more educated. You know, it's just going to be some people who are just going to be at what would appear to be a – a higher level. Now, I don't, or, or I don't na- naturally know gifted, level. so to speak. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, just naturally gifted, you know, people. Like when you, when you go to school, everybody's not going to be super smart. Mm-hmm. It's, it's going to be it's going to be a percentage of people who are, and that. But, but I always want to emphasize that that does not mean the people who aren't, you know, that that smart on that on that kind of level are any less than. Everybody just has different roles. Mm-hmm. So what W. B. Du Bois believed was that. It was that talented tense duty that since they were somewhat exceptional, that they were to use their exceptionalism in order to raise up the rest of their people. So it wasn't about him just saying, you know, it's 10% of us that are better than the rest of you guys. No, it was saying, all right, I, I recognize that some of us have a skill set that's a little bit different. We have a little more prominence. We have a little more power. We have a little more wealth. Well, us. We need to come together to lift up the rest of our people. So that's what the concept of the talented tip was about, uh, identifying who these people were and getting those people to uplift the rest of the race. And this is where we struggle at, and this is why the system of self-hate was created. So now you ask the question, did other people believe in the talented tip? Hell yes. Uh, John D. Rockefeller was one of, one of the champions for it. He fully, fully believed in it. Um, and most of the prominent Caucasians believed in it, which is why they created this system of self-hate. This is the whole purpose of this self-hate. If I can in- indoctrinate every black person uh, with this inferiority complex, with a white superiority complex, if I can indoctrinate all of them with feeling that something about their people is wrong and that they need to assimilate and integrate into white culture, I can keep that talented tense from ever wanting to help the 90% of their people because they're going to be focused on being a part of us. So now through that system of self-hate, that's what the goal is. A a system has to have a goal, and the goal of the system of self-hate is, uh, how do I forget the guy? I got so much going on in my mind right now, is to separate the black talented tense from the rest of their race in order to assure that they won't help the other 90% raise up. That's what this this whole system is about. Now, those who are in the 90%, the, the self-hate that they experience is just a byproduct of what the, what the real goal is. Because if they can continue to keep our wealthiest people, you know, like when they were trying to get Michael Jordan to speak out about something that was going on in North Carolina, and his response was, well, Republicans wear sneakers too. If, we can keep, if they can keep our billionaires from wanting to help the other 90%, then, hey, will never rise up because who's going to help us? They're not going to help us. And so that's what the system is about. So uh, W.D. Du Bois coined it. The Caucasians believed in it wholeheartedly, and they believed in it so much that they had to create something in order to counter it because they know if that talented test stays connected with the 90%, it's no way to stop us from rising up. My, my position with Du Bois is I wholeheartedly believe um, in the talented tenth, but I'm not a fan of anything else that W.B. Du Bois believed uh, up until the end of his life. Um, I am a Garveyite, um, right. and as you said, him him being against Garvey, him and the preachers and the whole Garvey must go campaign is probably the worst thing ever. Um, right. So I believe I believe the concept of a tenth percent because that's something that I feel like I can't I can't refute because I I, I can I can I can see that is a small percentage of us you know, of of every race that you know operates at a different level. But as far as him you know really wanting us to integrate sort of kind of uh, wanting us to have just European right. education right. you know and all of these different things and not wanting to be self reliant you know when Garvey Garvey hit the scene. You know, he wanted us to be self-reliant. You know, Papa Noble Du Ali wanted us to be self-reliant, and W.B. Right. Du Bois didn't. So outside of the concept of the talented tenth, I am not a fan of Du Bois um, at all. And in and, and, and his later writings, because he ended up being exiled. You know, he, he, he finished his life, in, you know, in Africa. 
you know, he looked back and regretted some of the things, you know, that he did. Mm -hmm. But he was just, he was a product of the education that he received. And so that's what this, that's what this system does. It, it, it sneaks up on you so subtly that you don't even realize you're working against your own best self-interest because it's packaged so well. It's packaged so well through the education that you just think, oh, yeah, this is good, and you don't even dig that you're going against your own people. That's why this system is so effective. <laughs> you know, brother, that's a book that I, have, that I have to get off the shelf that I haven't read yet called The Man in the Hat. Have you read it yet? No, I have not. Well, it talks about how... Du Bois undermined Garvey in a very shrewd and terrible way. I haven't read it yet. Yeah. I'm going to go in and out of it. I, I, I feel your position. As far as I'm concerned, Marcus Garvey had one of the biggest movies in the 20th century, one of the greatest leaders we ever had. Right? I'm yeah. with you on that. But in Du Bois development, remember where Du Bois comes from, how he's raised. See, a lot of us, how we raised, the institutions we go to. How do we break this white supremacy? Malcolm came across the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And, and Marcus Garvey had the picture of Jesus is black. So how, where we at, who influences us, and how we go, how we get there. That's the thing. How you start off is one thing, but how you end up is another. And you're going to make mistakes throughout the day. But right now, today, there's no reason why black people should not be black. Now, that was, that was the 20th century. Right now, today, schools, hospitals, businesses, economics, we should not, we should no reason not be on that track today. The internet, uh, you turn, look at these Uncle Toms today compared to what the, 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 the Uncle Toms were back then. I mean, Uncle Toms, Uncle Tom, a traitor's a traitor. We don't want no traitors. Okay. But these Negroes today should be much further than what they are today, sir. I want to know your opinion there. How do we get out of this with these Negroes? So, Tyreen, give us uh, a quick lowdown on on this, this book. Okay. I've been waiting for that for a long time. <laughs> right. So the book is essentially uh, a sketch, a historical and a biographical sketch of Washington's role in Africa, and which is pretty much clandestine and unknown for the most part. Most people know about Booker T. Washington's American exploits and position as a accommodationist. They don't see him as a radical figure or even as a Pan-Africanist or anyone who had anything to do with uh, the Pan-African world or the African world at all. They see Du Bois, you know, more or less as the Pan-Africanist. But Washington had a clandestine life which involved him propagandizing against the atrocities in the Congo Free State under King Leopold. Also included, you know, propagandizing and denouncing colonialism in South Africa, right? He also played a major role in negotiations to save Liberia, which was only one of two independent African nations on the continent at that time. And so this period is 1895 to 1915, which is also what I would consider the, our nadir, our lowest point in this country. But also the final case in the book is about the African exclusion measure where Washington uses the Tuskegee machine, his secret network to debunk and protest a measure that was designed to exclude people from Africa or African people coming from anywhere in the world into the United States, immigrating into the United States. So in effect, um, the measure was designed to lock the doors to people of African descent, African people, black people, anybody who could be seen as part of the African world family, so mm -hmm. on and so forth. And so all of this happened primarily behind the scenes, clandestinely, and is revealed in his personal papers, which are my primary source for uh, the research and the work that I did on the book and on his life. And so I'm saying essentially that all of those events and his relationships, he had a lot of relationships with African nationalists, John Dube, Semi of South Africa, founding members of the ANC. He actually had corresponded with and they exchanged very intimate details about the nature of the struggle on the African continent. And what I'm arguing essentially in the book is that this helped him develop into a Pan-Africanist. He's not in 1895, but 1915, 
He is a very well-developed Pan-Africanist as a result of all of these experiences. And he, he falters some at different moments because there is the Togo expedition where Tuskegee graduates go and participate in a cotton expedition or cotton experiment in Togo. But after all of these experiences and relationships, uh, he basically comes out on the other end as a pronounced Pan-Africanist who in the final moments of 1915, when the African exclusion measure is coming before the House of Representatives, he doesn't falter. He doesn't flinch. He, he knows exactly what he needs to do in terms of advocating for African people internationally, not you know, uh, domestically, internationally, you know, he identifies with Africans on the continent in Central and South America and the Caribbean. And that's who the measure really was directed at, Mm -hmm. not at African people from the continent, because there wasn't a large number of African people coming from the continent at that point in time. And so I'm arguing essentially that he develops into a Pan-Africanist and this is that story. He was also helpful to some Pan-Africanist leaders, Marcus Gave, for instance. Yeah, absolutely. That's in the book as yeah. well. Right. Now, you went to Tuskegee yourself. Oh, I went to Tuskegee, yes. Tuskegee. I'm <laughs> yes, sorry. I'm I an alumni. You Tuskegee. You're an alumni of so Tuskegee. So yeah. how is it that you came across this story? Make it short. And, <laughs> right. And Give also me the... use it as an opportunity to tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you are, you do have a PhD in history. I yes. Think, right? No, no, in public policy. In public so policy. I, so it's, it's, it, it makes sense that I'm looking at these policy cases in Washington stories. The right. Washington story, the Liberian crisis, which was a policy case, of course. And then the African exclusion measure, which is also another policy case. But um, yes, I'm a proud Tuskegee alumni, and uh, I was a history student. I was a student of history there. And that's probably the first time that I come across Washington as something out of the ordinary. Because, you know, we all come there with the typical perspective that Washington was an accommodationist. Even though we go to the school, we all say all the things that everyone else says in American society about Booker T. Washington. So, uh, and we're forced to read his, you know, biography up from slavery, autobiography up from slavery. But the point is, is that as a student of history, I had access to something called the lynching files. And I did a presentation on that. And what it was, was a collection of lynching articles on lynchings that took place in the United States from 1895 to 1915 that Washington himself had collected as a result of um, subscribing to all the newspapers in the United States and they were delivered to them and he would cut out and save all the documented cases of lynchings and I just thought to myself this guy you know someone who's like a accommodationist who's not opposing uh you know white domination and uh doesn't fight for social and political rights in this country this is unusual that he's even collecting and compiling this kind of information And so that was the first time I had a thought that "Mm, he's not who people really think he is. But it's much later on when I wrote my master's thesis in history, I actually had a chance to uncover and see that he had many relationships with African nationalists. And it was Manning Marable who wrote about that in an article called Booker T. Washington and African Nationalism. And he pretty much gives you a laundry list of Washington's African nationalist affiliates and Pan-Africanist affiliates and 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 really does drive home that the Tuskegee always had guarded su- support for black nationalists. So the conversation that we were having today in terms of South Africa, what's going on in South Africa and what's going on in Nigeria right. and the conversation that we're about to start having about the um, international decade for people of African descent. Yeah. And I can't help but imagine that we are having this conversation about Booker T. Washington. In the past year alone, there's been a lot of conversations about two people. It's um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And we now see the ascendancy, or the, I should say the reappreciation of uh, Malcolm X. Okay. You know, mm-hmm. and the new conversations that we're now beginning to, the new appreciation that we're now beginning to have for Malcolm X okay. and his contributions to our liberation struggle. Oftentimes, Booker T. Washington has been paired with his peer, who is, was also a very important player and okay. thinker, Dr. Du Bois. So it, it's, it's an extraordinary thing, I think, that 
we're now in a world where we can have these conversations. I grew up learning about those two. So it's either or. Okay. Right? It's either you follow uh, Dr. Du Bois or you follow... That's that's the way. That was the dichotomy. That was the way it was presented to us. Right. Um, I, you know. So given everything else that is going on in the world today, that we now have an African-American person as the president of the United States, mm, yeah. there's some reckoning going on in there. And we also have that situation where President Obama has to be placed next to these people, to these great minds. You know, I mean, he, we're, we're <laughs> constantly comparing him to them. Well, let me just say this. First, I argue, I take a non-traditional approach to Du Bois in Washington in the sense that I say that it's neither, you know, in terms of Pan-Africanism. They need... Neither of them influence how the other develops as a Pan-Africanist. And most people, most, like I said before, of Washington's development as a Pan-Africanist takes place clandestinely. These aren't things that he announces. These are things that he does, you know, to his own satisfaction and does not necessarily announce it to the world. You know, we only know these things, these facts about his life as a result of his personal papers. And I think other scholars basically, you know, this is kind of where I come in at. There are scholars who have dealt with this in very short pieces. And then there are scholars who who have had the lion's share of the task and failed to define what his relationship with Africa and in African affairs meant, right? And you have a handful of scholars who, you know, Michael West uh, or Hagby, uh, you know, a few others who, uh, Robert Norrell, doesn't talk about his Washington in Africa, but talks about what has happened with Washington's legacy and how essentially we miss some very important things about him. But in terms of the overall work, you know, yes, it's a piece that can give us some very interesting clues and models for how to deal with the world we live in, like the Liberian crisis. It was a shrewd negotiation between Washington and U.S. officials on the fate of Liberia. And without a doubt, Washington is aligned with Liberia and interested in protecting its survival from French, British, and German encroachment at the time. And this is in, it begins in 1907 and the case follows through to 1912 where there's a resolution. But in terms of policy, so you said before, you have a PhD. Yes, it's not in history. It's in public policy. Actually, I don't go hard on the policy end in the book because it is really just for people who can consume history. I'm not really, although I address scholars, I'm not really talking to scholars. I'm talking to those of us who can consume regular historical narrative and uh but it is it is nonetheless adding to the conversation that's the more important right it's like we're now able to look at some of those people in the past in our past some of the leaders in our past and see them from you know different dimensions right understand things about them that we never knew before so the conversation is changing right and so with with washington we can look we can invoke these models For today, because it's very interesting. I mean, you know, particularly regarding Africa, we expect if we were to superimpose it on today, we have some expectations of uh, Obama because he is, without a doubt, an African person, (laughs) or at least very least a person of African descent. I don't know how he personally identifies. I know he considers himself black. I heard him say, you know, when he's in New York, nobody says, hey, look at the mixed guy waving a cab down. They say, there goes the black guy. So Mm. he does know that much. Now, how much he, (laughs) you know, he's at least he's in perspective about that, right? Nobody says, don't stop the mixed guys waving for a cab. He said, you know, his response to why he doesn't say mixed, mixed, mixed every day is because, you know, in New York, he's just a black guy looking for a cab that's not going to stop. So my point is, is that he has some connection to Africa and we have some expectations of him as a result of that. But all of those things uh, involve some serious negotiations in the modern world. And so Mm -hmm. in my book, I talk about what are the final resolutions to a case like Liberia that ensures its survival, but also puts it in a very precarious position in relationship to the U.S. 
and what the deal was, meaning that the U.S. got to put a station, you know, a military base there. Then you have the establishment of Firestone and a host of other things that go along with bailing Liberia out of this crisis of encroachment by these colonial forces on the ground in Africa. So, you know, it's not a it's not a win. There's no heroes, but it's just, you know, as some other scholars that I know, it's survival culture, how we survive. What did he do to allow the survival of this independent African nation, one of only two on the continent, at a time where European nations were intolerant of African independence and felt as though any independent African nation should be seized if another European nation did not put its stakes on it, you know? Yeah. We certainly don't have enough time in the day or the week to fully discuss the Honorable Marcus Garvey's life, legacy, and philosophy, but uh, we're going to use the time we have, and since we don't have long, we're going to have to come strong. I say the Honorable Marcus Garvey, not only from the prison days that you mentioned, was the standard bearer of success under the rest, but I say he was the most instructive and productive leader we've ever had. This young man, when born in Jamaica in 1887, and yes, we're celebrating the centennial, so I'll be getting back to that later. But in 1887, when he was born in Jamaica, um, he was raised and praised by a mother who he considered too good for the world in which she lived and a father who was a maroon descent who had an impressive library uh, who made sure that young Marcus learned everything he could in fact his family had one argument when he was born because you know he his mother and father had 11 children only two of whom you know uh, lived to adulthood but they had an argument when he was born whether to name him Moses or to name him the Messiah one wanted to name him the Messiah another said no no he's definitely going to be a Moses no he's the Messiah so they decided to settle on Mosiah, and that's where his middle name, Marcus Mosiah Garvey, came from. Eventually, he was, uh, you know, quite ahead of his age when it came to his studies. He uh, went to school. He became an apprentice of his uncle, godfather, um, in Jamaica in the printing field. Uh, at a young age, I think it was 18, he began, became one of the foremen of the government printing press. Uh, he was uh, in charge of people twice his age, eventually... When the strike came about, he decided to throw his lot in with the workers who were protesting, even though he didn't have to. And as a result of that, you know, the strike was successful, but he lost his position as foreman, later uh, allowing him more time to focus on some of the nationalistic uh, endeavors in the island of Jamaica. Um, eventually, he wound up traveling to Costa Rica and getting to see the world, he was working on a banana plantation and he eventually started a couple of newspapers because he seen the workers weren't being treated fairly. He saw that everywhere he was traveling throughout Central America, Panama, Costa Rica, that a lot of the black workers who were uh, having issue, you know, once they were paid for their work, they were robbed shortly thereafter by the same people who paid them. And there was no recourse for them. You know, they tried to go to the British Embassy because they were British subjects, but there was no recourse for them. You know, the British Embassy kind of ignored them. So he eventually came back to Jamaica and went over to England to uh, contest the injustices afflicted against some of these British subjects. And, of course, there was no recourse there as well. So he began to see that there was a problem in the world, that, you know, we were everywhere being taken advantage of and exploited politically, economically, socially. And that we had, not like any other nation state, no king and kingdom, no men of big affairs, no uh, armies, no navy. So he vowed that he would begin to build such an association that would establish these things to become a self-governing, self-reliant people, that we would be independent and not dependent upon these folks who didn't care anything about us and didn't want for us what they wanted for themselves. So this is the mindset of the Honorable Marcus Garvey as he began to found the UNIA nearly 100 years ago today, uh, I guess on the, what, the, the, t the 20th of July will be the official 100th anniversary of the founding of the UNIA, so many of us are gearing up for that. Okay, so in this initial uh, world tour that Garvey's taken, he realizes African folks are being treated, mistreated all over, right? So he becomes a labor organizer. He's got a background in the printing press, and uh, Dr. Burroughs did an amazing discussion on um, uh, the crisis of the Negro world. It was titled, talking about both um, NAACP's crisis and the Negro world from Garvey's piece, and I want to get into that Du Bois and Garvey struggle in a little bit. Absolutely. We have that audio at our mix what I like dot org. I was here, Doctor Burroughs giving that presentation. It was off the hook. Uh, anyway, but so he he comes to this conclusion very quickly 
right? That we need our own government. We need our own space. We need our own political apparatus from which we can argue from a position of power. Absolutely. What were the forces that kind of churned his understanding of power at the global level so soon? Because our folks today in their full adulthood and eldership are still not getting that a black president of the United States does not equal a black president of the African world, especially not the African continent. Absolutely, absolutely. Mr. Garvey was one who was a lot broader in his thinking than many of his contemporaries, uh, the civil rights movement, who were much more narrow in their perspective. They weren't looking at human rights and they weren't looking universally outside of the U.S. and abroad for people of African descent. They were looking to gain some political advantage on a civil rights level and somehow earn a more prestigious title working for the government or some kind of, um, you know, better pay or something on a smaller level. But Mr. Garvey understood that African people were the cheap labor source of the world. He understood that Africa, our homeland, was the economic powerhouse of, of Europe. It was dependent upon the raw materials out of Africa. It was dependent on us. You know, they were dependent upon us, yet we thought we were really dependent upon them. And because he understood that our fight was a human rights struggle. It was a fight that was, as the quote you know mentioned earlier, is, is about the securing the true uplift of the race and the good of the human family. It's, it's a lot broader than just some civil rights. He looked to see a way of developing uh, a program of African redemption. And I, I hate to always compare us to the Jewish community, as many always do, but the Jewish community around the same time that they helped form and found the, the you know NAACP and financed it and had you know people fighting for civil rights they were fighting to find a homeland and you know the Zionist movement they were fighting to have an ancestral homeland or some land that they could declare as their ancestral homeland so they can have a degree of independence and self-governance and self-reliance and control industry and trade they were developing Hollywood they were you know developing the diamond and gold you know uh, industry at the same time, when Mr. Garvey was doing the same thing to try to exploit um, our native uh, wealth with you know rubber, with other minerals and resources that he and a team of delegates are sent to Liberia to help develop so that we can have a base of uh, the form of a mighty African nation or empire upon which we can lend support and protection to African people around the world. He was ridiculed. He was looked at as being... Um, racist and anti-human and all kinds of crazy terms and that's later why they tried to discredit him and decentralize this movement because they were threatened by him yet they were wanted these same things for themselves but they were trying to deny that of us as, as if we didn't deserve a right to regulate our own affairs and control our own destiny so you, you see a lot of hypocrisy with that and even today you look at the civil rights movement where we've come uh, since that time frame and look where we would have been had we taken the Jewish plan and been in charge and, and followed what the Honorable Marcus Garvey was uh, mandating for us, what the people actually mandated at the historic 1920 convention, which was the first and ever plebiscite that we've had of African descent, uh, people of African descent from all over the globe. But And we, want, we need to probably talk more about the 1920 convention also, that plebiscite. But, uh, you know, to see his plan and see how effective it was, and opposed as opposed to the civil rights plan to give us more rights and the um you know to be able to to go to the toilet and you know to be able to share facilities with other people that wasn't much of a plan of justice that didn't even to this day we don't have justice when we still having police uh, as they will uh shoot people even people who are not police as we can see in Trayvon Martin case uh, kill and murder and, and, you know, exploit us in a prison industrial complex anytime they will. You know, we have a black president, yet we don't have any more justice now than we had before he took office. So the political solution of civil rights hasn't done much for us as opposed to other plans that we've seen more effective, that were more nationalistic and that were, you know, uh, based more upon the model that the Honorable Marcus Garvey established, which to this day makes him the head of the largest black mass movement in the history of the world. And even civil rights people who came after him, who he set the precedent for, like Dr. King, considered him uh, their forerunner, you know, the one who prepared the way for them, who set the precedent for them to follow. And he considered him, uh, what was his exact quote, the first man to lead a mass movement in this hemisphere, a black mass movement, and to give us a sense of dignity and destiny and, um, you know, to give us a sense of somebodiness. 
And, you know, same, you know, certainly Malcolm X grew up in the Garvey movement. His family, you know, at a young age, he was uh, being taught, you know, taken around with his father to the mass meetings of the UNIA. He was being taught uh, by his mother, even after his father had passed for preaching the word of Garvey. He was being taught from the Negro world every week when the issues were coming out. And even when he was in school, when they asked him to sing the national anthem, he said, that's not my anthem. My anthem is the Universal Ethiopian Anthem, which was the UNIA's official anthem. And so he grew up with that influence of, you know, having some racial pride and identity. And later when, you know, after he went through his incarceration later, a lot of that came back to him. And even after he left the Nation of Islam, and the Nation of Islam certainly was founded by a Garveyite named Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Um, you know, later he continued to talk about for the first time since Garvey died, we're doing this and that, or, you know, every time you see an independent nation in Africa, you know that Garvey is still alive. So everyone kind of drew back to this image of this successful giant who had industry, restaurants, publishing companies, newspapers in four languages around the world that had all kinds of industry, trade, shipping line, um, you know, all kinds of success, millions of members. He had a parade in 1920 that was so long that it could stretch from here all the way past Six Flags, if you all know what that is in Washington, D.C. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. It's a 10-mile long parade. <laughs> he organized in 1920 an yeah. international convention where he had 25,000 delegates, and each delegate had to represent 1,000 people in that neighborhood. So if you imagine going around getting petitions from 1,000 people in your neighborhood to become a delegate at this international convention, and this international convention had 25,000 delegates to pack Madison Square Garden to capacity for 30 days, and then they had another 15,000 standby delegates outside trying to listen in. And, you know, people were jumping down from parades with playing the sax, you know, the Black Eagles, some other folks. But it was, it was, you know, so much excitement that he generated based on upon a few fundamental ideas that, um, you know, we can get into later. But Let me, let me just say real quick that uh, you were just listening to, to Brother Moriyama Kamau. And uh, this is I Mix What I Like here at WPFW 89.3 FM. I'm Jared Ball, your host. I mix what I like dot org for more. Dr. Hate is in the building, uh, but as you always say, hate is always in the building. Yeah, this is the UNI hate session, man. Yeah. This is, this is it right here. And we see the phone in the studio ringing a little bit. We're not taking calls at the moment, but uh, feel free to email us at imixwhatilike at gmail.com, and maybe we'll get to those comments while we're on the air. Certainly, we can address them uh, when we're not on the air as well. Just one thing I just wanted to say very quickly, this this... One of the main flaws I think that is is uh, that exists in comparing the African African experience to the Jewish experience is that the Zionist movement was and is an imperial project. So one of the problems with trying to emulate the Zionist movement, particularly if you're an anti-imperial worker as Garvey was, you're going to run into major problems, and the Zionist movement would not be successful were it not for its European imperial design. So uh, people trying to emulate that from the non-European, non-imperial world often going to run into these kinds of problems, but I think uh, the point was still well made. But, you know, please go ahead. Yeah. So let's get to um, the founding of the UNIA. Where is it founded? Who are the founders? What are the principles upon it, which it's based? Okay, uh, great question. Uh, the UNIA was founded in 1914 as Mr. Garvey was leaving... Uh, what was soon to be World War One in Europe, and he left um, after reading the Up from Slavery from Booker T. Washington. He began to understand that there was a way that we could develop educational institutions that could uh, begin to develop the skills necessary to become an industrialized group of people to be able to form industry, trade, and commerce, and to uh, engage in you know activities that would help to liberate us financially and politically and otherwise. So he came back to Jamaica with the idea of forming this association, which you know one of his main uh, aims was to set up an ins educational institution for trade in Jamaica, etc. And the association was formed in 1914, July 20. If he re he returned back to Jamaica in July 15th, five days later, he formed the UNIA and you know incorporated the UNIA. And launched it on August 1st uh, publicly. But one of the co founders, along with the Honorable Marcus Garvey, will later become his first wife, Amy Ashwood Garvey, who, you know, there's recently been a book by Dr. Tony Martin about her that has some controversial points. But she was certainly a co founder and, you know, long time active officer in the UNIA and the Black Star Line and a number of other projects. And certainly later, you know, on to uh, chair the uh, 1945 Pan-African Congress, and uh, she was pr quite active in Pan-African movements years later. But in 1914, when the movement was founded, it began to grow 
in Jamaica, there were certain challenges to, you know, initiating the program. It wasn't necessarily accepted by some in Jamaica um, because of the Jamaica uh, racial, uh, I guess you call it, uh, we're escaping the word I'm looking for. Colonial mentality. Yeah, but it's the, the stratosphere, I guess. There was a certain way you could elevate the becoming more independent if you were lighter skin or dark skin you know so if you had education that almost made you equal to being a light skin jamaican which was a higher up in the stratosphere so and good thing we don't have those problems anymore though. yeah i'm it's glad like, that's I'm all glad over. that's all over with there's <laughs> no bleaching cream in jamaica <laughs> right killing yeah but you know that that sort of thing was was an obstacle at the time of, of really successfully launching the campaign so the honorable marcus garvey went uh, you know, began communicating with Booker T. Washington. He came to Jamaica, I mean, to the uh, United States uh, to meet with Booker T. Unfortunately, Booker T. had passed before he had gotten there. And uh, and also, during the same time, uh, Henry McNeil Turner had passed away in 1915 uh, as well, right before he got there, who was another influence of Marcus Garvey, but that's another field that we can go into later uh, on Garvey and his some of the religious influence. But when he came to the U.S., uh, he, you know, eventually went on a 38 state tour and he began to uh, talk to people about the aims and objects of the UNIA, which among uh, many are to establish a universal confraternity amongst the race to um, uh, help the, uh, uh, you know, promote the spirit of pride and love to, excuse me, to uh, uh, help the sick and needy to establish commissionaries and agencies across the world to help lend support to people of African descent abroad. All these, you know, sorts of aims and objects he began to, I think he actually heard some of them mentioned in the beginning with the uh, presentation by Mr. Garvey that uh, Brother Ball had um, played in the beginning. But anyway, some of these aims and objects he was sharing going throughout the country and started to develop an appreciation for the need to organize in America. He's seen that in America people knew who they were, whether they had one drop or, or a thousand drops of black blood in their body, they knew who they were and they knew who they weren't. And so they were much more willing and interested in fighting and building and working toward the improvement or movement for the improvement of the race. So uh, he had a better audience, so he decided to establish in 1917 a uh, New York branch of the UNIA. Eventually they had some problems and later he dissolved that and in 1918 reincorporated the UNIA and that was the birth of the movement in many ways uh, that we most know the corporation status wise uh, later he incorporated again and he had um, separated and formed another UNIA in 1929 but that's another story